So I'll start with some motivation for candidate screening. Say an employer would like to hire candidates for jobs. Of course, she's only interested in the skilled ones. Also, we assume that the hiring cycle is endless. So think about a big enterprise that never stops hiring employees. Now, the problem is that given a candidate, the employer cannot observe his underlying skill level. Instead, she can only estimate it by performing a series of tests or interviews. This introduces a trade-off between the quality of the signal, which requires many tests, and maintaining a low hiring budget, which is done by minimizing the number of tests. Now, before we move on, let's review some related work. In general, there is a line of research in economic literature, which is called statistical discrimination. In these works, there are candidates with unknown qualities and only one signal, which can be thought of as a single test result. And this signal is characterized by a group dependent level noise, uh, noise level, sorry. Our work involves richer mechanism and in particular, we, con we consider multiple tests and optimize over them. What about computer science? So you've probably heard about the growing in interest in combining fairness in machine learning systems, in which a task of binary classification is often considered, where the candidates are characterized by both protected and unprotected features. So by protected, you can think of any attribute that shouldn't have an impact on the prediction, such as gender or race. And the goal is to get an accurate predictions that also satisfy one or more fairness notion, such as demographic parity that requires protected feature to be independent of the predictor, or equalized false positive and or false negative rates among different groups. Don't worry if you don't know the notions, I'm gonna uh, define anything that is uh, relevant. Okay. So in our work, there are two types of model and we're gonna start with the Bernoulli model. So we assume we have an infinite pool of candidates. Each candidate I, has a binary skill level yi, which is sampled from a Bernoulli distribution with a known parameter p. Once it is sampled, a skill level of a candidate is fixed. It, it stays permanent. So each candidate is either skilled, hence yi equals one, with probability p, or unskilled with probability one minus p. So now, after we have established that each candidate has an underlying skill level, we can start talking about tests. We assume that binary, sorry, we assume that the tests are, bi are also binary. So each test results in either zero for fail or one for pass. But just like in real life, skilled candidates sometimes fail tests and unskilled candidates sometimes pass them. So the tests in our model are noisy. Formally, each test has a fixed probability of flipping the skill level of a candidate. This probability will be referred to as the noise level of a test. It is determined by a noise parameter sigma, which is also known now, uh, the noise in our model is symmetric. So the probability that a skilled candidate would fail a test is the same as for an unskilled candidate to pass a test. Now we can give each candidate a series of independent tests to evaluate them and, and evaluate them based on their test results.
So how does an employer should decide whether to hire someone or not? We will talk about two types of uh, policies. First, the threshold policy, which has a fixed number of tests per candidate. It accepts candidates if and only if they pass at least theta out of tau test. So after tau independent test from a single candidate I, the policy then decides whether to output one for acceptance, meaning that it classifies the candidate as skilled, and zero for rejection, in case it classifies the candidate as unskilled. And stop me if uh, anything is uh, unclear to you. The other type is the dynamic policy, which reevaluates candidates after each test and decide whether to accept, reject, or simply keep on testing. So in this policy, the number of tests, tau, becomes a, a random variable. Now let's move on to some optimization objectives. We start by attacking the problem from a classic machine learning perspective and minimize false positives and false negatives. So in our model, false positive error occurs when an unskilled candidate is classified as skilled and false negative error occurs when a skilled candidate that is classified as unskilled. And of course, if we want to use the threshold policy, we have to balance between them. Since a high threshold theta, meaning that we accept less candidates and this result in low false positive rate, but high false negative rate, and low theta, low threshold, uh, results in accepting a lot of candidates, meaning that uh, our false negative rate would be low and our false positive rate would be high. So given a candidate I, and we know that we can measure a loss with respect to the skill level of, its, of this candidate and the classification by the policy. So we have yi and pi of i for the classification. Skill level and classification. So given a candidate, uh, we introduce this alpha loss which is parameterized by a parameter alpha between zero and one, which gives a, a cost of alpha for false positive mistake and a cost of one minus alpha for false negative mistake. And for each par parameter alpha, we want to find a policy that minimizes the expectation of the alpha loss. Okay, so we look at the expectation of the loss and we want to find the policy, which is, at, which is a threshold policy, meaning that it depends, it depends on the tau and theta that minimizes this expected loss. Now we can probably, so now we can properly define the task. We are giving with skill and noise parameters, P and sigma, a parameter that, de that determines how to balance between false positives and false negatives, alpha. And let's also assume for now that we are also given with the fixed number of tests, tau, and find out what is the optimal threshold, the optimal number of tests that a candidate should pass in order to be ex accepted by pi, so that the the alpha loss, the, the expected loss, would be minimized. Okay. So in this case, we can show that the loss function we defined earlier is in fact quasi long, uh, sorry, quasi convex, and derive the optimal threshold theta star as a function of all the input parameters. For example. When p equals half and alpha equals half, meaning that each candidate has an, 
has an equal probability to be skilled or unskilled, the, the optimal threshold would be simply majority. Sorry. But how many tests do we actually need to get an accurate prediction? So let's stick to the assumption that P equals alpha equals half for a moment. And remember that our noise level is one minus sigma over two. So when we apply majority decision rule, if we want to bound the loss by delta, we need at, at least order of one over sigma square ln of one over delta for any parameter delta. And the question is, can we do better? Is this really uh, the best thing we can do? Okay. So to answer this question, let's introduce some more objectives. First, there is the false discovery rate, which is a fraction of the unskilled candidate, candidates accepted by the policy. So you can see how the false discovery rate is actually proportional to the false positive rate uh, when there is a, a certain uh, probability to be accepted by the policy. Similarly, we can define the false omission rate, which is the fraction of skilled candidates that were rejected by the policy. So again, by using base rule, we can see that the, the false omission rate is proportional to the false negative rate, given some uh, uh, acceptance or rejection probability by the policy. Now let's enhance our optimization problem in a way that would also optimize over the fixed number of tests, tau. So for this, I want you to consider a budget parameter, B, which is greater than one. We still have a noise parameter, sigma, which determines the noise level. Also, let's assume that our group of candidates is balanced, meaning that P equals half. So if we think like an employer, we would like to find the policy with false discovery rate as low as possible under the constraint that the expected number of tests per hire is never larger than B, the budget parameter. So for this, we show that there, sorry, uh, we show that for any set of parameters, we can find an optimal policy and that it would be a randomized threshold policy. Where randomized policy basically means that if a candidate passed more than theta test, he is accepted. If he passed less than theta, he is rejected. And whoever passes exactly theta test has a probability R for being accepted by the policy. Okay, so we, we sort of have this optimization problem where we think like an employer and we want to minimize the false discovery rate. Uh, so we want the fraction of unskilled candidate that were hired to be as low as possible with this uh, constraint that uh, uh, prevent us from not hiring, hiring everyone because if we simply minimize this false discovery rate, we would end up hiring no one. Uh, and then we encountered some unexpected uh, problems. So let's see an example. Let's say our budget is 80 and the noise level is third. So with probability of uh, third, the test result is uh, flipped. For skilled candidate, with probability third, the pro uh, a skilled candidate fails a test with probability third and an unskilled candidate passes the test with probability third. In this case, the optimal threshold policy 
is to hire someone if and only if they passed exactly, he passed exactly three out of three tests. Okay, so there are two issues with, the, with this policy. First, candidate who failed the first or second test would have to go through more tests, which is not exactly how we imagine the optimal policy should be because they have to do these tests for nothing. They would eventually be rejected by the policy anyway. Second, let's imagine a candidate who passes two out of three tests. This candidate is rejected by the policy. Even though he is more likely to be skilled than any other freshly candidate from the pool, because we know our candidates can only be skilled or unskilled. So if a candidate passed two out of three tests, we can show that they are more likely to be skilled than uh, a new candidate from the pool for which we have no test results. The problem is, if we change the policy to accept this candidate who passed two out of three tests, we naturally increase the false discovery rate. So the solution is to keep testing these candidates that seems more likely to be skilled than untested candidates. So we can formalize this exact idea. For any set of parameters, any candidate who pass, passes the majority of the previous test is more likely to be skilled than any freshly new candidate from the pool that we haven't tested yet. And this theorem tells us that the best thing to do with a candidate who passed the majority of the previous test, but still hasn't reached the required, the required false discovery rate, is to keep on testing him. Okay, so this is the prior probability, and we know that our candidate is more likely to be skilled than the prior probability, in this case, if we haven't reached the false discovery rate, we should keep on testing him. This brings us to the greedy policy, which is a dynamic policy. So the greedy policy goes like this. We denote epsilon for the desired false discovery rate. So let's say our employer decide, I want no more than 5% false discovery rate. We keep on testing as long as the posterior probability that the candidate is skilled, given his test result, is higher than the probability that a new candidate is skilled and lower than one minus epsilon. Once this posterior probability is higher than one minus epsilon, meaning that we are fine with the current false discovery rate with respect to this candidate, the candidate is hired. If it drops below the prior, below P, then he is rejected. Now, if we also care about fairness, we also, we also want to take care of, uh, for the false uh, negatives, for the false omission rate, then we should require that the false omission rate would be some epsilon prime, uh, which would be lower than P. And then we can change the decision rule so that uh, if, uh, if the posterior probability, oh, that, that only if the posterior probability is lower than epsilon prime, which is lower than P, the prime probability, then the candidate is rejected. Okay, so how do we analyze a policy? which does not have a fixed number of tests. We reduce the problem to gambler's rule. So I'll talk about it for a minute and then we'll, go, we'll get back to our problem. Gambler, gambler's ruin is basically a one-dimensional random walk with absorbing barriers. And it goes like this. Consider a gambler who starts with an initial fortune of $1. And in each gamble, 
either wins a dollar with probability p or loses a dollar with probability one minus p or q. Now we can denote xj as the random, value, random variable that represents the total fortune after j gambles. The gambler's objective is to reach a total fortune of n dollar without getting without first getting ruined, meaning that he ran out of money. If the gambler succeeds, then the gambler is said to win the game. In any case, the gambler stops playing after winning or getting ruined, whichever happens first. Is everything clear? Yes. Now let's get back to our problem and reduce it to Gabler's rule. The starting point of each candidate is the prior log odds. So after each test result, so we have, we set X zero to be the log prior odds, which is log of P over one minus P. And after each test result, we update the log odd, odds as follows. If a candidate passed the test, meaning that uh, y hat equals one, then we move one step to the right in the walk towards the acceptance, uh, towards the acceptance step. If the test result is zero, we want to move one step to the left. So if we set y hat to zero, then this here becomes minus one, and we move one step size to the left. Since the probability for a flip is the same among skilled and unskilled candidates, our random walk has a fixed step size and the test result only determines the direction. To complete the reduction, we make sure that our lower absorbing barrier matches the case where the posterior skill level dips below the prior skill level or epsilon prime if we care about false omission, false omission rate as well. And the upper absorbing barrier matches the case where the posterior prob probability that the, that the candidate is killed is uh, the posterior probability uh, is uh, higher than one minus epsilon. Um. Can I ask a question? Sure. Where do you take into account the number of the dynamic change of uh, in the number of uh, tests? Because here you said uh, like so. Test. So in the dynamic policy, we can decide whether to accept, reject, or to admit another test. So unless we uh, so like in the gambler's ruling, the the game ends when he reaches zero or n. So at, as long as the candidate is uh, between zero and n, uh, we would keep on testing him until he reaches either uh, reject, uh, rejection or acceptance. And this depends on the noise level, on the prior skill level pro probability, okay? I have another question. Mm -hmm. Where does it start? I mean, uh, when a new uh, candidate arrives uh, and he do one test, wh which state uh, goes? One? Okay. Yeah, so uh, it's basically one because, uh, okay, so unless you care about false omission rate, it starts with one. And if a candidate fails the first test, then he is uh, rejected because if we think like an employer, a candidate that failed the first test is more likely, more likely, uh, is less likely to be skilled than a new candidate. If we also care about for submission rate, then we don't want to uh, to have uh, such a high false negative rate. Then we would have to. Uh, 
change it so that um, it won't start in one, but rather somewhere in the middle. And basically, every state in the on the walk is the log odds of the candidate to be skilled. So if we have here uh, the, the prior log odds, then after each test result, we update the log odds of this candidate based on the test result. And eventually, we make sure that if the candidate reaches zero, then uh, this is the, the rejection. Uh, this means that uh, he passed the rejection uh, limit. And if he, if he reached the uh, end, or uh, it means that uh, the false discovery rate is low enough for us to accept him. Okay? Yeah, thanks. Now, this analysis allows us to derive several results. First, we show that the greedy policy minimizes the expected number of tests under the false discovery rate, and if we want the false omission rate, constraints. So this is indeed the, the optimal policy because it minimizes the expected number of tests. Second, we can calculate the expected number of tests based on the input parameters. So we can actually have, uh, for any problem instance, we can get the expected number of tests. And third, we can get a confusion matrix, which will depend on the input parameter. So remember that epsilon is the desired false discovery rate, and it can be as small as we want it to be. In return, if we want to set a, re a really low false discovery rate, then we would have to pay for it with a higher number of expected, uh, uh, with a higher expected number of tests, okay? So if we want our policy to be accurate, we need more tests, this is very natural. We can also have false omission rate by setting the rejection at epsilon prime. Uh, but also here, if we want epsilon prime to be small, then it would increase the expected number of tests. Okay, so we can get the confusion matrix based on the parameters. And let's see what we can do with this results. So now we will add another group of candidates to the picture and see how this analysis can also help us with fairness constraints. So let's say we have two groups of people, blue and red, where the color represents some value of the protected feature. And let's say that, that, that means that we don't want to uh, have uh, to, that the policy would, uh, that the color of the group would affect the, the policy decision. So let's say both of them have the same skill level parameter P, but different noise levels. Candidates from the red group would have higher probability for a flip test result. Now, uh, so for example, you can think about, uh, let's say you want to uh, choose candidates for a PhD in the Hebrew University, and you, you are unfamiliar with the recommendation writers or their grading standards at the university. Or, so for example, you can think about, uh, let's say you, you test two candidates, one is from Tel Aviv University, and the other is from the University of Tokyo. So I assume that you would uh, have a better evaluation for, uh, uh, reco uh, for, uh, for the writers of the recommendation letters from Tel Aviv University rather than the University of Tokyo. And you would also uh, be able to estimate uh, what, what uh, the grading what uh, this candidate's grade means about him 
uh, better in Tel Aviv University rather than the University of Tokyo. So now when we consider such groups with uh, different noise levels, an impossibility result emerges. If we want to use the same policy, whether it's threshold or dynamic for both groups, candidates from the red group, the one with the higher level of noise, suffer from high false high, higher false negative rates and higher false positive rates. In addition, since unskilled candidates are being hired, they are very likely to end up being fired. Later on, employ employers might also ironically conclude that this group's average skill level is lower than it actually is. So there's a huge damage here for the red group, the one with the higher level of noise. So how can we fix it? How can we make the policy to be more fair? This is where we can wield the power of the dynamic policy and achieve some fairness. We can equalize the false positive rate and the false negative rates by giving more interviews to people from the red group, which is the noisier one. This is still not a magic solution, as it will require people from the red group to do more interviews, more tests, but it would yield the same confusion matrix entries for both groups. So if we control epsilon, we can give different epsilon, mm -hmm. di di different uh, false discovery rate, uh, di different uh, desired false discovery rate for each book, so that the false positive rate would be equalized among the group. We can also take the, the table for the false omission rate and take care for the, take care of the, so that the false negative rate would also be equalized among groups. This would cost us more tests. Okay, uh, so now I'm gonna move on and I'm gonna, uh, so, so far I, I uh, said that the parameters P and Sigma are known for each group. Now I will show you what, uh, what would happen in case they are unknown and how we can evaluate them And uh, we would introduce, uh, I would introduce an unsupervised parameter estimation for this uh, P and sigma. And surprisingly, we, we don't even need uh, ground truth labels. It goes like this. So it would be completely unsupervised. It goes like this. Assume we have at least two test results from M candidates from the same group. Now, we can simply estimate P and sigma as follows. We denote by C the percentage of the candidates in the data set with inconsistency in the first two tests. We know that the number, that this number can be viewed as a Bernoulli random variable with this as a parameter. Now we can extract an estimation for sigma as well. Uh, for sigma, sorry. The same goes for p. Uh, so we denote by v the percentages, the percentage of the candidates with a positive first test, and we already know what is the parameter this p is generated from. We know this is the the parameter, so we can plug in uh, sigma hat and extract p hat, our estimation for uh, p in this group, okay? So we took a bunch of candidates from the same group and estimated the, the group parameters without uh, knowing the actual skill level of the candidates, just by looking at the test results. Finally, we can use chain of bound and derive the needed number of candidates from each group for a good estimation of these parameters, okay? So we know exactly, uh, what, uh, what should be the number of candidates in each group in order to have a good estimation for the parameters. Okay, so in the beginning of the talk, I mentioned that there are two models. 
And here comes the second one. In the second model, there is a Gaussian model similar to the one in the economic literature, only that we here we have multiple tests in, instead of just one. So here, a worker quality Q is normally distributed with mean parameter mu Q and variance sigma Q squared. So now, instead of a binary skill level, we have a continuous quality. As for the noise, condition on this Q, a test is generated by adding noise to the quality, where the noise is once again symmetrical as, and sampled from a normal distribution with a mean parameter zero and some variance parameter, which, it, which we also assume that we know, but we also have an unsupervised uh, way of extracting it. So for this model, we also have an impossibility result, the same, that is the same, uh, that using the same uh, policy for two groups with different noise levels, achieves worst false positive rates and worst, worst uh, uh, false negative rates for the noisier group. And to fix it, we can once again increase the number of tests for the noisier group by multiplying the number of test candidates uh, from uh, the, the noisier group yet in the variance, in the ratio between the, uh, the variances, the noise variances. Okay, uh, so uh, I'll, I'll conclude and then, and then uh, you can uh, ask questions if you like because uh, you, are, you are a little bit silent today. Okay, so in this work, we assume that when a candidate arrives, we know which group he is from. So we can estimate P and sigma of his group and then the optimal thing to do would be to, to use the, the greedy policy in a way that the false positive rates and also false negative rates, if you want, uh, would be the same across all groups that we hire from. And we know this is the most efficient thing to do. Okay, uh, so thank you very much and uh, feel free to ask questions. I have a question, if it's possible. Mm -hmm. uh, can you please go back to the slide uh, containing the random walk with uh, the sure. arrows? This one or the other one? Yeah, th this one is perfect. So uh, my question is that uh, using a standard uh, literature on the random walks, it is known that if you start at a given position and the probabilities uh, of going left or right are uh, half, that uh, then you will stay in a, a square root of n of the, uh, of, of the origin. Uh, something like that. I don't remember the exact uh, numbers. But my, my question is, uh, isn't it, uh, do you have a bound of the number of, uh, number of tests this, uh, uh, this method will uh, require. I mean, because if P and Q are uh, approximately equal to each other, then uh, I guess uh, it is possible that this dynamic approach will require a very large number of tests. Yes, so in the paper we have, uh, we have calculated the, the expected number of tests uh, for any candidate and for skilled candidates and uh, what is the expected number of tests until you hire someone and all of these things. Uh, you're right that, uh, so for example, if you don't care about the false omission rate, then you would uh, end up rejecting a lot of uh, good candidates. Um, but this policy here makes sure that we reach the false uh, discovery rate and the false omission rate that the employer uh, wants to, to have with the minimal uh, number of tests. 
Okay, and do this minimal number of tests is uh, is reasonable? I mean, a polynomial or something like that? Yeah, the, the uh, so it's about uh, one over uh, sigma square. Okay, interesting, thanks. Sure. Any other questions? Okay, so again, thank you, Lee, for... Uh, That's very interesting, thank you. Talk. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I really enjoyed it. Um, okay, and uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me.